there's my last slide. <laughs> we can just jump straight to that. <laughs> All right, there we go. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Eliza Dawson. I'm a PhD student at Stanford University. And um, I actually thought it would be fun to start with some uh, GoPro footage from the snorkeling activity that we had done on Sunday, uh, which went to uh, Roman Road. And I was like, oh, this would be so great. It's a perfect example of local sea level rise. Alas, I forgot my cable, so I can't get the footage off my GoPro. <laughs> so I guess we're going to have to just jump straight into the science. But I want to bring you back to Wilkes Subglacial Basin, which um, is great because now that we're in day three, a lot of people have talked about this region. And so I think that there's already a lot of motivation for studying and trying to understand this area better. Uh, but I'll tell you about some of the pieces that I think are particularly important for kind of motivating uh, the analysis that I'm going to show you. Um, so I'm focusing on this area here, which is my study area connecting the Wilkes Basin area to the uh, coast here, which is called Adelie George Five Land Coast. And in this region, uh, there's really two fast flowing glaciers with retrograde bed slopes um, that are kind of like the arteries of Wilkes Basin, Cook Glacier and Ninnis Glacier. And you will notice in this dotted outline here, these ice plug areas, um, which come from this analysis back in 2014. Um, and what they kind of identify these regions as um, in a bunch of, this really came out of a bunch of uh, some model experimenting that they did where um, they forced their model uh, under 1.8 degrees C of ocean warming. And what they see is when the grounding line got past these ice plug areas, then the region became uh, susceptible to unstable retreat, um, which could result in as much as three to four meters of sea level rise if the grounding line could get past these regions. So that makes these regions really interesting in terms of better understanding what the conditions are in these patches close to the coastline. Um, this same region, also there's evidence of past grounding line retreat. Uh, here's just one example. There's many studies that have recently been coming out. Um, but you can see here the grounding line retreated almost 300 kilometers, um, about 330,000 years ago. Um, and it is known that both the, the grounding line in this region, you know, seems to be sensitive to warm seawater intrusion in the past and could be again in the future. Um, but I want to bring us more to the grounded ice and think about the thermal state there, and in particular, these regions of the bed um, that are frozen but close to thawing and could potentially be thawable under changing climate conditions. Um, and a paper um, that I had a year ago where I did modeling simulations of all of Antarctica and looked at the ice sheet's susceptibility uh, to uh, modeling the effect of thawing, this region really popped out. Uh, where you can see in the Wilkes subglacial basin area, uh, it's particularly sensitive to changes in um, the grounded ice basal thermal state. So more prescribed thawing in my model simulations, this was using ISSM, um, resulted in more mass loss. So now I want to switch to kind of an observational uh, component and say, um, you know, this region's interesting. Model analysis shows that the, the grounded ice area could have both frozen and thawed areas and maybe some areas that are close to thawing, kind of an intermediate state. Um, what does the observation show? And I'm going to show you that we can go all the way from radar sounding surveys to actually kind of a map of uh, frozen and thawed. Um, so from radar sounding, you can derive bed echo power. Um, and if you don't already know this, from bed echo power, uh, you can get two radar observables that tell you about the thermal state. One is the depth average attenuation rate, and another is bed reflectivity. Why? This is because if your radar signal has to attenuate through or has to travel through warmer ice, you will get more total attenuation. So that will be reflected in your depth average attenuation rate. The other reason is because, um, the reason why bed reflectivity matters is because if your uh, 
ice bed interface is thawed or has a wet bed, you have a brighter reflection. So combining these two pieces, you could think, would tell you about what the basal thermal state is. I am just gonna note that uh, for people that maybe know more about the radar processing, I'm skipping all the processing steps, but feel free to talk to me more afterward. Uh, to get attenuation, I apply uh, Dusty Schroeder's 2D adaptive attenuation method. Um, okay, so now we're starting to look at some results. Um, here are maps of attenuation rate and bed reflectivity. I'm calculating the bed reflectivity as a relative value, so all this means is each value is relative to the mean. Um, and you can start to see, if we kind of think about general patterns, a couple of things start to emerge. In thawed bed areas, you can kind of start to uh, find, maybe, where you have uh, higher reflectivity values and uh, uh, higher attenuation rates, and maybe you can start to pick out some frozen bed areas too, or regions that you might think are frozen. Um, but I think that there's still quite a bit of ambiguity, and it's hard to really say for sure what these maps are saying and how to really interpret and combine them. Um, so here's where I'm gonna show you uh, an approach that I took to actually take this all the way to a map of the thermal state. And what I'm using is a logistic regression uh, framework to do this analysis. As predictors for the logistic regression, I'm using both attenuation rate and reflectivity. I'm also using ice thickness because there was a bit of scaling between attenuation and rate and reflectivity um, that changes with ice thickness, um, just in terms of how that pattern varies. Um, so these are all predictors straight out of the radar data. Um, and then I train it on areas that we have higher confidence in the bed already being thawed or frozen. So really, really fast flowing regions like um, the main trunks of some of these really fast flowing glaciers and some really cold regions like um, uh, some like ice rise areas where there's almost no flow and it's really likely that the bed is frozen. And then I use this uh, after the logistic regression is trained on these areas to classify uh, the thermal state conditions. And here we can see the result of that. Um, you'll see in the blue to purple colors, um, frozen and likelihoods. So more higher confidence to lower confidence and the same for thought. How do I get these likelihoods? How am I getting this uncertainty in addition to this map? Um, it's really because I'm taking an approach where I'm saying uncertainty is okay. And in fact, it's hard to train, it's hard to know the exact thresholds and trying to kind of embrace that more. So you can see that I ran a bunch of different processing steps with more strict and relaxed processing. Um, so for example, it's hard to identify training areas. Uh, so what I did was change that a little bit and say let's use a more aggressive threshold velocity for really fast flowing or more lenient to kind of allow for uncertainty in that. And then the same for the radar processing, kind of allowing uncertainty thresholds there. And then what I do is I interpolate that. So it's just going from those radar lines to an interpolated map like this. And then for each of these, basically, I have to create the individual realizations. I do thresholding. So I basically say, again, this is a way to account for uncertainty. With the thresholding, what I'm doing is I'm saying, at some point, this value, it's going to be closer to zero frozen, closer to one if it's thawed. I need to cut it off, right, and say like along this spectrum, this is likely frozen, likely thawed, but I'm gonna also allow that to vary. So I use 0.3 and 0.7, 0.4 and 0.6 on all of these realizations. So then you can see realization one to eight is stacked together to produce this figure. So that's how I'm kind of looking at both um, where it's likely frozen and thawed, but also how we can think about uncertainty in these predictions. So you could say these Darker areas, basically, I'm most confident in it being thawed or frozen. These other areas is less confident. And you can also think, um, like, the useful part about this kind of area is, let's say you want to really understand one of these less known areas better. Well, you could get more data there. You could improve your understanding of the training or the processing and basically improve this map or make the dark colors larger. Um, so I think this brings us to an interesting point now of how can we compare this to models? Um, how can we compare like a direct observational constraint to existing ice sheet models? 
Um, the top panel shows some uh, the basal temperatures that I derived, uh, but you can also see some comparisons to different thermal states from ISMIP-6 models that were used in that analysis, and the uh, temperature fields were released as part of that. And obviously, there's quite a bit of variability. That makes sense, but you can start kind of identifying some of these uh, uh, darker colored patches and see where they are here. You can also really notice in these ice plug areas that there's some intermixed, potentially uh, near thawed, a little bit more closer to frozen areas, but areas that would be really useful to uh, uh, better constrain. Uh, so I'll just leave you with some of the main takeaways. Um, I think it's, it would be interesting to look more into these ice plug regions. I think that more uh, observations in this area could help us better constrain what the thermal state is here, but I think it suggests that it is thermally interesting in this area. We don't see all thawed. We don't see all th frozen. Um, and I think that there's a lot more that could be done on the side of using this to constrain ice sheet models. And lastly, I'll just point out that I think this type of framework could be applied to lots of other subglacial questions. If you have radar data in summer, you could use it to look at grounding zone locations or subglacial lakes. This is just a couple examples. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Great talk, Eliza. Thanks very much. Uh, we do have time for a quick question. No, if you, if you, oops, are you, are you wanting to ask a question there, Tina, or are you just waving at me? <laughs> Thanks for a great talk, and I'm sorry I missed the very beginning if you show what I'm going to ask, but um, I'm curious um, to know whether you try to overlay your results with the geology and what that might look like. No, I haven't yet. I also think that would be interesting. Um, yeah, that's something that I would be curious to talk to more people about, for sure. So, yes, you didn't miss it. <laughs> Very cool. Thanks. You did miss your former student's talk, Tina. Oh, okay. Um, last talk of the session, um, Terry. <laughs> 